Welcome back to the Agoric Cafe for more coffee and philosophy. In keeping with the Randian theme of today's video, the background I've got behind me is the uh, city of uh, Uray, Colorado, which was the uh, original inspiration for Galt's Gulch and Atlas Shrugged. So I'll give you a little bit of a look at it there. And I've uh, put a link to the uh, the Creative Commons license for this photo in the description. Uh, so the uh, the town is spelled O U. The town's name is spelled O U R A Y, but it's pronounced Ure. I can't help it, as Eleanor Hurst would say. Anyway, so. Uh, various criticisms have been made of Ayn Rand, and some of them are merited and some of them aren't. But one of the criticisms that I've always found the oddest is the claim that she's a bad writer. Uh, there's even a uh, book about Rand called How Bad Writing Destroyed the World. I confess I haven't read it, but by any measure, I guess the title at least is guilty of the form of bad writing known as hyperbole. Uh, it seems to me that, you know, whatever you think of the content of her ideas, it seems obvious to me that she writes beautifully and powerfully. Of course, Rand herself was often unable or unwilling to recognize the literary merits of other authors, but that's no excuse for imitating her. Now, a few specific criticisms we sometimes hear. One is that people complain that she gives her characters unrealistic names, so her heroes tend to have heroic sounding angular names like Kira Arugunova, Ragnar Daneskjold, and Dagny Taggart. And her villains have soft and squishy names like Ellsworth Tui, Tinky Holloway, and Wesley Mooch, or Mouch. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Uh, back in college, I wrote a Rand parody in which the hero was named Rip Slash Goldklanger, and the villain was named Dr. Mushy Turd. Uh, but, you know, Charles Dickens also passes judgment on his characters by giving them names like Thomas Gradgrind, Uriah Heep, Ebenezer Scrooge, and Mr. Smallweed. And Sinclair Lewis, who incidentally was a major influence on Rand, in fact, she even called him the greatest living writer, although he doesn't seem to be a favorite of most of Rand's admirers today. But Sinclair Lewis signals the disreputable character of some of his uh, or at least the trivial character of some of his uh, uh, people in his novels by giving them names like Pinky Parrot, Adelbert Shoup, and Brazilius Windrip. It turns out there really is an actual person named Adelbert Shoup. I'm very sorry about that. But. Uh, so it's kind of a you know, double standard if uh, you know, Dickens and Lewis get a, you know, get a pass for doing that and Ayn Rand doesn't. Uh, another criticism is that the dialogue in Rand's novels is unrealistic. Well, yeah, it is often unrealistic. It's also unrealistic in musicals that people break into song. Uh, it's unrealistic in Shakespeare's plays and people suddenly break into iambic pentameter. Um, you know, you, in analyzing something, you have to understand the kind of genre the person is, is trying to write in. And Rand is writing uh, a stylized version of reality, as she always made very clear in her in her, in her essays on literature, which are a, a mixture of wisdom and folly, uh, but uh, you know, generally she, she gives good reasons for liking what she likes, but terrible reasons for disliking what she dislikes. Um, that applies perhaps more broadly than just to her literary essays, but anyway. Um, but she makes clear that you know, she's writing a stylized version of uh, reality not perhaps to the same extent that, uh, that an Elizabethan play or a Broadway musical is a stylized version of reality, but still it is. Um, and you know, so complaining that the dialogue is unrealistic is in some ways missing the point. Now, of course, she called her, uh, her approach a form of realism, but she meant something very specific by that, and she distinguished it from uh, naturalism. Um, and we can quibble about whether she's chosen exactly the right terminology there, but anyway, she makes it clear that she, by realism, she doesn't mean that, uh, you know, that her people will talk the way people actually talk in everyday life. That's, you know, one of the many sins of the 
uh, Atlas Shrugged movie trilogy is that there was an attempt in that trilogy to have the people talk more than we people talk in everyday life. And, it, and there are mixtures of sort of authentic Randian dialogue thrown together with uh, with stuff that's not. Um, and it uh, it's, sounds uh, awful. It's, um, uh, it's as though in the middle of a Shakespeare play, the main character suddenly said, um, oh, you know, well, let's, you know, let's, you know, I'm getting pretty hungry, let's go out and have a McDonald's or something. It's just, uh, it doesn't work. Anyway, oh, uh, Another criticism that people make of her novels is that the characters give long philosophical speeches. Well, yes, they do, but it's not as though Rand is the only author ever to have her characters give long philosophical speeches. Uh, Dostoevsky did it. Uh, think of, the, for example, the Grand Inquisitor section in The Brothers Karamazov. D.H. Lawrence does it, for example, in Women in Love. You know, Thomas Mann does it in Dr. Faustus and The Magic Mountain. And of course, also we switch from the novels to dramas. You have dramatists from Sophocles and Euripides to Shakespeare and Corneille, uh, in which the characters give long philosophical speeches to each other. So again, it seems a kind of double standard to think that there's some special, something especially objectionable about characters in Rand doing this. And of course, Dostoevsky is what a, was a major influence uh, on Rand. I'm not sure about, uh, you know, who else, but, uh, yeah. And of course, another influence on Rand was Nietzsche, in particular Nietzsche's uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which is not exactly a novel, but it is a long fictional narrative in which the protagonist is constantly making long speeches. And uh, that's definitely uh, an influence uh, on the, you know, the very style of the speeches is, uh, is often you know, echoing Nietzsche. People often think that her, that the content of her philosophy is more Nietzschean than it is, but certainly, you know, stylistically, there was a big influence. And in turn, two of Nietzsche's models for Zarathustra were the New Testament on the one hand, and Plato's dialogues on the other. You consider in particular, uh, among Plato's dialogues, consider ones like the Protagoras, the Symposium, the Menexenus, the Clitophon, the Timaeus, and the Critias, and of course, most obviously, the Apology, those are all, you know, we call them dialogues, but they're all devoted either in whole or in large part to the characters giving long speeches to each other rather than to, you know, dialogue in any straightforward sense. And, um, and you know, Socrates, um, I mean, Plato's doing that, but Plato writing the dialogues though he did, that was in turn was reflective of the practice of Greek drama. Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Aristophanes, they all, uh, you know, they all have the characters give long speeches to each other uh, or to the audience. Um, and likewise, it was a practice of Greek historiography. I mean, look at, at, uh, at Thucydides, Herodotus, and Xenophon, their, their historical works are filled with these dramatized and clearly at least partly fictionalized speeches. This was you know, just part of the literary tradition. So, you know, you shouldn't expect a Wagnerian opera to resemble a Harold Pinter play or vice versa. Uh, Ayn Rand's writing a particular kind of thing. In some ways, it is more like a Wagnerian opera than it is like a, a normal novel. Um, you have to adjust your ordinary expectations and try and uh, meet her where she's at. Another criticism, again, this is criticism of her dialogue and Actually, I'm going to be mostly talking about her, her style rather than her dialogue, but I want to say a few things about her dialogue. People claim that all her good characters sound alike and all her bad characters sound alike, and that's not really true. I mean, you know, take her good characters, take her, among her heroes, I mean, no one's going to confuse the stoic seriousness of Howard Rourke with the sardonic playfulness of Francisco d'Anconia. And likewise, among her villains, you're not going to confuse the elegant barbed witticisms of Ellsworth Toohey with the venomous whining of James Taggart. I, I will say that if, if I had to have uh, lunch with one of, or coffee,
with one of Rand's villains, definitely two we would want to pick. You'd have interesting conversation. Can't imagine having a conversation with James Taggart. I have no idea what one would talk about. Uh, also, it's often claimed that all the characters are black or white. Um, that's not true either. There are various intermediate characters. There are characters who get better. There are characters who get worse. In particular, in the Fountain, the four main characters, Dominic Franken, Gail Wynand, Howard Rourke, and Peter Keating, represent, represent, represent respectively four different conceptions of egoism. So there's the Stoic conception that Dominique represents. Uh, egoism as a, or as a matter of seeking independence through complete, complete withdrawal from attachment uh, to the world. Now uh, there's the Nietzschean, which Gail Wynand represents, which is the idea of egoism as you know, conquering and seeking power. Uh, there's Rourke's, which is sort of, it's Aristotelian, although it's partly Stoic inflected, it's partly Nietzschean inflected, it's partly classical liberal inflected, but it's, you know, compared with the others, it's Aristotelian which is supposed to be a way of, of seeking strength without uh, power and of uh, independence without uh, withdrawal. Um, and then finally, Peter Keating represents sort of the everyday conception of selfishness, the, the guy who just runs roughshod on, uh, over people to advance his own career and will, you know, twist himself into, into a pretzel to please clients in order to get more money, more fame, more popularity. So there are four different ways of thinking about egoism. And of course, Rourke is the one that Rand is, is commending. And the other three are all supposed to be failed or confused versions of it. But all of them are portrayed to some degree sympathetically. Even Keating, to a surprisingly great extent, is portrayed sympathetically. Um, I mean, you, in the novel, you, you you really want him to be saved. You, you know, whereas you don't, in Atlas Shrugged, you don't really care whether James Taggart gets saved. He seems like a lost cause from the start. Uh, but in, in The Fountainhead, you really want Keating to be saved. You want him to get together with Catherine. You uh, want him to find his way out from under Tui's influence. Uh, and it seems sort of tragic that he doesn't. You know, it's a spoiler alert. There's a bunch of spoilers in this video, I have to warn you. Um, although if you haven't read the, no the novel, if you have read the novels, you already know these things. And if you haven't read the novels, you probably won't remember which characters I'm talking about. So it's not going to be a big deal. So anyway, mainly I'm going to read a bunch of passages to you. Um, I said that I wasn't going to be doing a lot of reading to you in this series and I'm not, but, but, uh, seems like the best way to illustrate, uh, Rand's merits as a writer is to read some passages. <clears throat> um, you know, attention to any IP hawks out there. Uh, you know, these passages I'm, that I'm using and my use of them is paradigmatically fair use. The passages are intended to illustrate the works they're drawn from, not to replace them. The passages represent a very small portion of the works they're drawn from. The use is educational and non-commercial. And uh, at least I think that uh, my quotation of these passages is more likely to stimulate sales of the original works than to discourage them. So uh, it hits you know, some of the major categories of fair use. I mean, uh, so, you know, hey, YouTube, don't take this down because I've got, uh, I'm quoting a bunch of stuff from Rand in it. Uh, this, is, this is fair use. Rand might not regard it as fair use, but Rand's views on intellectual property were more strange even by sort of prevailing standards. My point in doing this is that I think a lot of people are so hostile to her ideas that they haven't permitted themselves to appreciate the quality of the writing. I'm not here today to defend her ideas. I think some of her ideas are great. I think some of her ideas are terrible. I think some of her ideas are in between. Um, I've, you know, I've written about a lot of that uh, in the past, and I may talk about it some more on, in this channel, but um, that's not what I'm here for today. Today, I just want to say, don't let, whatever you think of ideas, don't let them, 
blinded to the quality of her writing. Now, does that mean I think that the content of an author's ideas is, is not relevant to aesthetic assessment? I don't actually think that. In fact, I'm on record arguing the opposite. And so here's a quotation from myself from a 2004 blog post, and I'll link to that in the description too. Suppose two writers do an equally skillful job of translating their understanding of human nature into novelistic form. But one writer's understanding is subtle and profound, whilst the other's is superficial and naive. Should this difference have no effect on our critical appraisal of the two novels? The artistic value of a work of art is not an additive sum, but an organic unity. Features that have no artistic relevance by themselves may thus acquire artistic relevance, and so become subject to critical appraisal by receiving appropriate artistic expression. Indeed, there is no such thing as the expression apart from what is expressed. Successful expression is not a separable ingredient. They can be hooked up uh, now with this expressible and now with another. The successful expression of a profound idea is simply a different animal from the successful expression of an, of an insipid idea. It is not a gluing together of two distinct and independently uh, accessible components, an idea on the one hand and a content neutral expressive technique on the other. And again, to read the rest of what I say about that, um, uh, look in the description. But having said that, it doesn't mean that a work's aesthetic value is completely exhausted by the truth of the ideas it expresses. And anyway, a lot of ideas and artworks are a complicated mixture of truth and error of insight and confusion. And even ideas that are literally false can be metaphorically true or symbolically true or whatever you want to call it. And thus they can be particularly apt for artistic expression, even if they're not right in themselves. So, for example, do you have to agree with, say, André Gide or Thomas Mann or D.H. Lawrence? Uh, those are three thinkers whose ideas I think are at least as problematic as anything in Rand. Uh, do you have to agree with them, or with the ideas and with their attitudes, or God forbid, with their personal lives, to recognize their literary achievements? Do you have to agree with Richard Wagner's anti-Semitism and his Schopenhauerian pessimism to recognize the beauty of his operas? Do you have to agree with whatever you think Nietzsche's philosophical ideas are to recognize the beauty of his prose and of his poetry, too? And of course, Nietzsche is the thread that links Wagner, Gide, Mann, Lawrence, and Rand together. I didn't pick those names at random. But I once taught a course on those six. Uh, Nietzsche, Wagner, Gide, Mann, Lawrence, and Rand. Nietzsche and Modern Literature. It's probably my favorite course I've ever taught. Also seems to be one of the ones my students liked most as well, but I don't know if I'll, if I'll get another chance to teach it. Uh, since, uh, it was it was a special course and uh, not not one of the regular rotation. Anyway, whatever you think of Rand's ideas, try to put put your opinion aside for that, and just try to let the beauty of her writing find you, just as you can let the beauty of Wagner's Liebestod find you, the the, uh, the final aria in uh, uh, Tristan and Isolde. Even though the point of the aria is to express a Schopenhauerian rejection of life and an embrace of self-extinction. So, no, not good ideas from my point of view. Um, and that's what the aria is about, at least that's how I read it. Um, but that doesn't make it any less beautiful. Uh, maybe, I mean, some you could argue it makes it a little less, less beautiful. Uh, maybe if it were, uh, maybe if it had truer content, it would be more beautiful. I don't know. but. Anyway, it's pretty damn beautiful. There's no, there's no major aesthetic criticism to make of it. All right, so I'm going to read a bunch of passages as I threatened. Uh, this really needs someone with a better voice and better dramatic skills, but I'm what you've got. Uh, I'm hoping that the light will manage to shine through the limitations of my particular lantern glass. Okay, first passage. This is from the Fountainhead, part one, chapter 15. From the train, he looked back once at the skyline of the city as it flashed into sight and was held for some moments beyond the windows. The twilight had washed off the details of the buildings. 
They rose in thin shafts of a soft porcelain blue, a color not of real things, but of evening and distance. They rose in bare outlines, like empty molds waiting to be filled. The distance had flattened the city. The single shaft stood immeasurably tall, out of scale to the rest of the earth. They were of their own world, and they held up to the sky the statement of what man had conceived and made possible. They were empty molds, but man had come so far, he could go farther. The city on the edge of the sky held a question and a promise. All right, this next one is from We the Living, part one, chapter 15. This is when the main character is returning at night through the streets of Soviet Petrograd after a grueling compulsory Marxist study group. Kira walked fast and listened to her own footsteps, listened blankly without thought. She could think now, but after so many hours of such a tremendous effort not to think, not to think, to remember only not to think, thought seemed slow to return. She knew only that her steps were beating, fast, firm, precise, until their strength and their hope rose to her body, to her heart, to the throbbing haze in her temples. She threw her head back as if she were resting, swimming on her back, close under a clear black sky, with stars at the tip of her nose, and rooftops with snow clean in the frozen starlight like white virgin mountain peaks. A lot of Rand's most evocative writing is about people on solitary nighttime walks through large cities. And I think that was part of what I might call her film noir sensibility. Like one of the covers of We the Living portrays just such a lonely walk. Reveries of the solitary walker, to, to quote a very different author. Um, but actually, that cover of the We the Living would probably suit a lot of scenes in the Fountainhead even better than We the Living. Anyway, here's here's one of those songs. Here's such a scene from the Fountainhead. This is Fountainhead Part One, Chapter Nine. Uh, I'm citing by parts and chapters rather than by page numbers, because page numbers can differ from edition to edition, but parts and chapters are uh, the same. Um, and so until there are Stephanus numbers or Becker numbers for Ayn Rand, that's, that's the most reliable form of citation we've got. He turned into side streets leading to the East River. A lonely traffic light hung far ahead, a spot of red in the bleak darkness. The old houses crouched low to the ground, hunched under the weight of the sky. The street was empty and hollow, echoing to his footsteps. He went on, his collar raised, his hands in his pockets. His shadow rose from under his heels when he passed a light and brushed a wall in a long black arc like the sweep of a windshield wiper. Naran apparently liked that windshield wiper imagery because she uses it again in At the Shrugged in the uh, John Galt Line uh, train ride scene, which incidentally I think does a really nice job of capturing the phenomenology of the view you get from a train. Uh, particularly if you've been on a train in the Rockies, which I have, uh, and she had. Um, so this is from At the Shrugged Part 1, Chapter 8. The green-blue rails ran to meet them like two jets shot out of a single point beyond the curve of the earth. The cross ties melted as they approached into a smooth stream rolling down under the wheels. A blurred streak clung to the side of the engine low over the ground. Trees and telegraph poles sprang into sight abruptly and went by as if jerked back. The green plains stretched past in a leisurely flow. At the edge of the sky, a long wave of mountains reversed the movement and seemed to follow the train. Things streaked past, a water tank, a tree, a shanty, a grain silo. They had a windshield wiper motion. They were rising, describing a curve, and dropping back. The telegraph wires ran a race with the train, rising and falling from pole to pole in an even rhythm, like the cardiograph record of a steady heartbeat written across the sky. She had barely grasped the sparkle of a lake ahead, 
and the next instant she in next instant she was beside it then passed the town had been left behind the track was rising through a country growing more grimly reluctant to permit approach the rails kept vanishing behind curves and the ridges of hills kept moving closer as if the plains were being folded into pleats the flat stone shelves of colorado were advancing to the edge of the track and the distant reaches of the sky were shrinking into waves of bluish mountains far ahead they saw a mist of smoke over factory chimneys then the web of a power station and the lone needle of a steel structure they were approaching denver it was a succession of minutes, but it hit them as a single whole. First, they saw the lone shapes, which were factories, rolling across their window panes. Then the shapes fused into the blur of streets. Then a delta of rail spread out before them like the mouth of a funnel, sucking them into the Taggart station, with nothing to protect them but the small green beads of light scattered over the ground. From the height of the cab, they saw boxcars on sidings streak past as flat ribbons of rooftops. The black hole of the train shed flew at their faces. They hurtled through an explosion of sound, the beating of wheels against the glass panes of a vault, and the screams of cheering from a mass that swayed like a liquid in the darkness among steel columns. They flew toward a glowing arch and the green lights hanging in the open sky beyond, the green lights that were like the doorknobs of space, throwing door after door open before them. Then, vanishing behind them, went the streets, clotted with traffic, the open windows bulging with human figures, the screaming sirens, and from the top of a distant skyscraper, a cloud of paper snowflakes shimmering on the air, flung by someone who saw the passage of a silver bullet across a city stopped still to watch it. Then they were out again on a rocky grade, and with shocking suddenness the mountains were before them, as if the city had flung them straight at a granite wall, and a thin ledge had caught them in time. They were clinging to the side of a vertical cliff with the earth rolling down, dropping away, and giant tiers of twisted boulders streaming up and shutting out the sun, leaving them to speed through a bluish twilight with no sight of soil or sky. The curves of rail became coiling circles among walls that advanced to grind them off their sides. But the track cut through at times and the mountains parted, flaring open like two wings at the dip of the rail. One wing green, made of vertical needles, with whole pine serving as the pile of a solid carpet, the other reddish brown made of naked rock. She looked down through the open window and saw the silver side of the engine hanging over empty space. Far below, the thin thread of a stream went falling from ledge to ledge, and the ferns that drooped to the water were the shimmering tops of birch trees. She saw the engine's tail of boxcars winding along the face of a granite drop and miles of contorted stone below she saw the coils of green blue rail unwinding behind the train a wall of rock shot upward in their path filling the windshield darkening the cab so close that it seemed as if the remnant of time could not let them escape it but she heard the screech of wheels on curve the light came bursting back and she saw an open stretch of rail on a narrow shelf the shelf ended in space the nose of the engine was aimed straight at the sky. There was nothing to stop them but two strips of green-blue metal strung in a curve along the shelf. Okay. Later in the book, we have a less happy train journey. Uh, this is at the Shrug, part two, chapter 10. She sat at the window of the train, her head thrown back not moving, wishing she would never have to move again. The telegraph poles went, went racing past the window, but the train seemed lost in a void between a brown stretch of prairie and a solid spread of rusty graying clouds. The twilight was draining the sky without the wound of a sunset. It looked more like the fading of an anemic body in the process of exhausting its last drops of blood and light. The train was going west as if it too were pulled to follow the sinking rays and quietly to vanish from the earth. She sat still, feeling no desire to resist it. She wished she would not hear the sound of the wheels. They knocked in an even rhythm, every fourth knock accented. 
and it seemed to her that through the rapid running clatter of some futile stampede to escape, the beat of the accented knocks was like the steps of an enemy moving towards some inexorable purpose. She had never experienced it before, this sense of apprehension at the sight of her prairie, this feeling that the rail was only a fragile thread stretched across an enormous emptiness, like a worn nerve ready to break. She had never expected that she, who had felt as if she were the motive power aboard a train, would now sit wishing, like a child or a savage, that this train would move, that it would not stop, that it would get her there on time, wishing it not like an act of will, but like a plea to a dark unknown. She had found reassurance for two days in the sight of the cities moving past her window, the factories, the bridges, the electric signs, the billboards pressing down upon the roofs of homes, the crowded, grimy, active, living conflux of the industrial East. But the cities had been left behind. The train was now diving into the prairies of Nebraska, the rattle of its couplers sounding as if it were shivering with cold. She saw lonely shapes that had been farmhouses in the vacant stretches that had been fields. But the great burst of energy in the East generations ago had splattered bright trickles to run through the emptiness. Some were gone, but some still lived. She was startled when the lights of a small town swept across her car and, vanishing, left it darker than it had been before. She would not move to turn on the light. She sat still, watching the rare towns. Whenever an electric beam went flashing briefly at her face, it was like a moment's greeting. She saw them as they went by, written on the walls of modest structures, over sooted roofs, down slender smokestacks, on the curves of tanks, Reynolds Harvester, Macy Cement, Quinlan and Jones Pressed Alfalfa, Home of the Crawford Mattress, Benjamin Wiley Grain and Feed, Words raised like flags to the empty darkness of the sky, the motionless forms of movement, of effort, of courage, of hope, the monuments to how much had been achieved on the edge of nature's void by men who had once been free to achieve. She saw the homes built in scattered privacy, the small shops, the wide streets with electric lighting, like a few luminous strokes crisscrossed on the black sheet of the wastelands. She saw the ghosts between, the remnants of towns, the skeletons of factories with crumbling smokestacks, the corpses of shops with broken panes, the slanting poles with shreds of wire. She saw a sudden blaze, the rare sight of a gas station, a glittering white island of glass and metal under the huge black weight of space and sky. She saw an ice cream cone made of radiant tubing, hanging above the corner of a street and a battered car being parked below, with a young boy at the wheel and a young girl stepping out, her white dress blowing in the summer wind. She shuddered for the two of them, thinking, I can't look at you. I, who know what it has taken to give you your youth, to give you this evening, this car and the ice cream cone you're gonna buy for a quarter. She saw on the edge beyond the town a building glowing with tears of pale blue light, the industrial light she loved, with the silhouettes of machines in its windows, and a billboard in the darkness above its roof. And suddenly her head fell on her arm, and she sat, shaking, crying soundlessly to the night, to herself, to whatever was human in any living, living being. Don't let it go. Don't let it go. Okay, this next one is from We the Living, book one, chapter two. This is a very brief description of Kira's cousin, Irina. I've always been fond of this passage because it reminds me of my first girlfriend, although I don't know whether that's a uh, universally valid aesthetic uh, uh, principle, but. A door crashed open behind her and something came flying into the anteroom, something tall, tense, with a storm of hair and eyes like automobile headlights. And Galina Petrovna recognized Irina, her niece, a young girl of 18 with the eyes of 28 and the laughter of eight. And here's Irina later on when she and her lover are being sent to Siberia. This is We the Living, part two, chapter eight. Uh, 
Irina and Sasha sat facing each other on hard wooden benches. They had traveled together part of the way, but they were approaching a junction where Irina was to be transferred to another train. The car windows were black and lustrous, as if sheets of dusty patent leather had been pasted behind the glass panes. Only the fluffy, wet stars of snow smashing against the glass show that there was an earth beyond the panes and wind in the black sky. A lantern trembled high under the ceiling, as if every knock of the wheels under the floor kicked the yellow flame out, and it fluttered and came back again, shivering, clutching the little stub of a candle. A boy in an old green student's cap, alone by a window, sang softly, monotonously through his teeth, and his voice sounded as if he were grinning, although his cheeks were motionless. Hey, little apple, where are you rolling? Sasha held Irina's hands. She was smiling, her chin buried in an old woolen scarf. Her hands were cold. The wheels grated under the floor, slowing down. Oh God, Sasha moaned, is that the station? The car jerked forward and the wheels went on knocking under the floor like a mallet striking faster and faster. No, Irina whispered breathlessly, not yet. Irina was whispering, listen, Here's something we can do. We can look at the moon sometimes, and you know it's the same moon everywhere, and we would be looking at the same thing together that way, you see? Yes, said Sasha, it will be nice. A lantern swam past the window. Then there was nothing but the silent snowflakes splattering against the glass, but they sat, frozen, staring at the window. Arena whispered, I think we're approaching. Sasha sat up, direct, erect, his face the color of brass, darker than his hair, and said, his voice changed, firm, If they let us write to each other, Irina, will you, every day? Of course, she answered gaily. Will you draw things in your letters, too? With pleasure, here. She picked a small splinter of coal from the window ledge. Here, I'll draw something for you right now. With a few strokes, swift and sure as a surgeon's scalpel, she sketched a face on the back of her seat, an imp's face that grinned at them with a wide crescent mouth, with eyebrows flung up, with one eye winking mischievously, a silly, infectious, irresistible grin that one could not face without grinning an answer. Here, said Arena, he'll keep you company after, after the station. At the station, another train was waiting on a parallel track. The guard tore her away from him and pushed her out through the door. She leaned back for a second for a last look at Sasha. She grinned at him, the homely, silly grin of her imp, her nose wrinkled, one eye winking mischievously. Then the door closed. The two trains started moving at once. Pressed tightly to the glass pane, Sasha could see the black outline of Arena's head in the yellow square of a window in the car on the next track. The two trains rolled together, iron mallets striking faster and faster under the floor, the glow of the station swimming slowly back over the dark floor of the car that Sasha was watching. Then the grayish patch of snow between them grew wider. He could still touch the other train with his outstretched arm if the window were open, he thought. Then he could still touch it if he were to fling his whole body straight to the other train. Then he could reach it no longer, even if he were to leap out. He tore his eyes from that other window and watched the white stretch that was growing between them. His fingers on the glass, as if he wanted to seize that white stretch and hold it, and pull with his whole strength and stop it. The, the tracks were flying farther and farther apart. Mm -hmm. At the level of his eyes, he could now see the bluish, steely gleams of wheels whirling down narrow bands in the snow. Then he did not look at the snow any longer. His glance clung to the tiny yellow square with a black dot that was a human figure far away. And as the yellow square shrank swiftly, his eyes would not let it go. And he felt his glance being pulled, stretched, with a pain as excruciating as a wrenched nerve. Across an endless waste of snow, two long caterpillars crawled apart, two thin silvery threads preceded each. The threads led, disappearing into a black void. 
Sasha lost sight of the window, but he could still see a string of yellow spots that still looked square, and above them something black moving against the sky that looked like car roofs. Then there was only a string of yellow beads dropping into a black well. Then there was only the dusty glass pane with patent leather pasted behind it, and he was not sure whether he still saw a string of, a string of sparks somewhere, or whether there was something burned into his unblinking, dilated eyes. Then there was only the imp left on the back of the empty seat before him, grinning with a wide crescent mouth, one eye winking. My aforementioned girlfriend used to wink and grin exactly that way. So again, that may be biasing my appreciation of this passage. Um, though we, ne we were never sent to Siberia. Uh, uh, things went badly, but not that badly. <laughs> Okay, this next one is from Anthem, uh, from part two of Anthem. Anthem is a different literary style from her novels and it's even more stylized uh, uh, than the others. Well, she officially described it as a novella or a novelette. Um, uh, you could argue it's really a short story and that it's only by, you know, by dint of, of large font and wide margins that it ends up filling a book. Um, but actually, she said in one of her letters to Rosewater Lane, there was a poem, which I think is actually fairly accurate. It's a, it's a poem. It does, it's not in verse, uh, but it is uh, much more poetic. Anyway, than her other novels, or her other, than her novels. Anyway, so from Anthem, part two. Where the city ends, there is a great road winding off to the north. And we, oh, oh, before I start, I should say, one feature of, of Anthem, if you don't, know about it is that it's about a uh, a, um, a society that uh, doesn't use uh, it's a collectivist society that doesn't use singular pronouns so uh, when he says we he sometimes means we and sometimes means I and when he says they he sometimes means they and sometimes means she I mean so that's what's going on here so but you know I think you'll figure out from the context where the city ends, there's a great road winding off to the north, and we street sweepers must keep this road clean to the first mile post. There is a hedge along the road, and beyond the hedge lie the fields. The fields are black and plowed, and they lie like a great fan before us, with their furrows gathered in some hand beyond the sky, spreading forth from that hand, opening wide apart as they come toward us, like black pleats that sparkle with thin green spangles. Women work in the fields, and their white tunics in the wind are like the wings of seagulls beating over the black soil. And there it was that we saw Liberty 53000 walking along the furrows. Their body was straight and thin as a blade of iron. Their eyes were dark and hard and glowing, with no fear in them, no kindness and no guilt. Their hair was golden as the sun. Their hair flew in the wind, shining and wild, as if it defied men to restrain it. They threw seeds from their hands as if they deigned to fling a scornful gift, and the earth was a beggar under their feet. Okay, this next one is from We the Living, Part 1, Chapter 3. The Argunov summer residence stood on a high hill over a river alone in its spacious gardens on the outskirts of a fashionable summer resort. The house turned its back upon the river and faced the grounds, where the hill sloped down gracefully into a garden of lawns drawn with a ruler, bushes clipped into archways, and marble fountains made by famous artists. The other side of the hill hung over the river like a mass of rock and earth disgorged by a volcano and frozen in its chaotic tangle. Rowing downstream, people expected a dinosaur to stretch its head out of the black caves overgrown with wild ferns, between trees that grew horizontally into the air, huge roots like spiders grasping the rocks. For many summers, while her parents were visiting Nice, Beritz, and Vienna, Kira was left alone to spend her days in the wild freedom of the rocky hill, as its sole undisputed sovereign in a torn blue skirt and a white shirt whose sleeves were always missing. The sharp sand cut her bare feet. 
She swung from rock to rock, grasping a tree branch, throwing her body into space, the blue skirt flaring like a parachute. She made a raft of tree branches and clutching a long pole sailed down the river. There were many dangerous rocks and whirlpools on the way. The thrill of the struggle rose from her bare feet that felt the stream pulsating under the frail raft through her body, tense to meet the wind, the blue skirt beating against her legs like a sail. Branches bending over the river brushed her forehead. She swept past, leaving threads of hair entwined in the leaves and the leaves leaving wild red berries caught in her hair. The first thing that Kara learned about life, and the first thing that her elders learned, dismayed, about Kira, was the joy of being alone. By the way, that uh, reference to the dinosaur sticking its head out, I think is a, is a nod to what was one of her ch favorite childhood novels, Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World, which is one of them one of the original uh, novels about dinosaurs surviving into the present day. Not the, not the first one. Um, there's uh, Jules Verne's uh, uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth, uh, which has, well, not technically dinosaurs, but large extinct prehistoric reptiles uh, surviving. Um, but not dinosaurs in the technical sense. But of course, the dinosaurs in the technical sense include birds, and you know, we're not going there. Um, uh, anyway, inspired by the Lost World, Rand and her sister Nora used to play at being pterodactyls, um, which are also not dinosaurs in the strict sense, but you know, science. Um, and they called themselves, nicknamed themselves Dact One and Dact Two. I'll let you guess which one was Dact One. Um, Anyway, uh, on to the next passage. Uh, this one. This one is from the uh, Fountainhead, part four, chapter 16. This is another nighttime city walk. Um, uh, and got another dinosaur reference to boot. I mean, maybe we should really have a, a crossover or a mashup in Jurassic Gulch. Anyway, it's only a bottle cap, thought Wynand, looking down at a speck of glitter under his feet, a bottle cap ground into the pavement. The pavements of New York are full of things like that, bottle caps, safety pins, campaign buttons, sink chains, sometimes lost jewels. It's all alike now, flattened, ground in, and makes the pavement sparkle at night, the fertilizer of a city. Someone drank the bottle empty and threw the cap away. How many cars have passed over it? Could one retrieve it now? Could one kneel and dig with bare hands and tear it out again? I had no right to hope for escape. I had no right to kneel and seek redemption. Millions of years ago, when the earth was being born, there were living things like me, flies caught in resin that became amber, animals caught in ooze that became rock. I am a man of the 20th century and I became a bit of tin in the pavements for the trucks of New York to roll over. He walked slowly, the collar of his top coat raised. The street stretched before him empty and the buildings ahead were like the backs of books lining a shelf, assembled without order of all sizes. The corners he passed led to black channels. Street lamps gave the city a protective cover, but it cracked in spots. He turned a corner when he saw a slant of light ahead. It was a goal for three or four blocks. The light came from the window of a pawn shop. The shop was closed, but a glaring bulb hung there to discourage looters who might be reduced to this. He stopped and looked at it. He thought the most indecent sight on earth, the pawn shop window. The things which had been sacred to men and the things which had been precious, surrendered to the sight of all, to the pawing and the bargaining, trashed to the indifferent eyes of strangers, the equality of a junk heap. Typewriters and violins, the tools of dreams. 
old photographs and wedding rings, the tags of love, together with soiled trousers, coffee pots, ashtrays, pornographic plaster figures, the refuse of despair, pledged, not sold, not cut off in clean finality, but hawked to a stillborn hope, never to be redeemed. Hello, Gail Wynand, he said to the things in the window, and walked on. Stand here, he thought, and count the lighted windows of a city. You cannot do it. But behind each yellow rectangle that climbs, one over another to the sky, under each bulb, down to there, see that spark over the river, which is not a star? There are people whom you will never see and who are your masters. At the supper tables, in the drawing rooms, in their beds and in their cellars, in their studies and in their bathrooms, speeding in the subways under your feet, crawling up in elevators through vertical cracks around you, jolting past you in every bus. Your masters, Gail Wynand. There is a net longer than the cables that coil through the walls of this city, larger than the mesh of pipes that carry water, gas, and refuse. There is another hidden net around you. It is strapped to you and the wires lead to every hand in the city. They jerk the wires and you moved. You were a ruler of men. You held a leash. A leash is only a rope with a noose at both ends. He came to a corner. He had escaped other corners like it, but this one caught him. It was a dim corner, a slice of sidewalk trapped between the wall of a closed garage and the pillars of an elevated station. The street was empty a long corridor filled by the skeleton of the elevated. Stone paving, blotched walls, the interlacing of iron pillars. There were lighted windows, but they looked as if no people moved inside the walls. A train thundered over his head, a long roll of clangor that went shuddering down the pillars into the earth. It looked like an aggregation of metal rushing without human driver through the night. Okay, this next one is from Red Pawn, part three. Red Pawn is in the early Ayn Rand, which in general does not contain her best writing. It is early unpublished stuff, which she didn't publish mostly for a reason. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend someone who is starting with Rand to begin with the early Ayn Rand. Uh, it's not, as I said, her best writing, but this um, I quite like. So in this passage, it's a description of a remote island monastery that's been converted to a Soviet prison. Leonard Peikoff says the moral of this passage is to show the essential equivalence of Christianity and communism. To me, the passage suggests more contrast than, than equivalence, but I'll let you be the judge. But it seems to me that he's, you know, he's reading this, uh, you know, just as many of Rand's critics uh, read her works through the lens of what they, you know, what they believe about her. I think he's doing the same thing here because he knows that she believed that Christianity and communism were essentially identical. Therefore, uh, he thinks, well, that must be what's going on in this passage. But, you know, listen to the passage. It's, it seems to me that, uh, you know, although clearly neither Christianity nor communism is being endorsed in this passage, they're both alien to her, uh, uh, her own, uh, view of life, uh, it seems to me there's a kind of tragic grandeur that she's allowed in Christianity in this passage that she isn't the communism. I think she's, there are other passages, I, but the character of uh, Andre Tagana from We the Living, I think grants a kind of tragic grandeur to communism as well. But if we're talking about this passage in this work, uh, see, uh, and also she has passages for Christianity does not have tragic grandeur, but it seems in this passage, Christianity has tragic grandeur, communism does not, so I claim. Anyway, so this is a description of the uh, uh, the uh, a room in the monastery that's been converted into a, the prison library. The sacred emblems and icons which could be removed had been taken down, but the old paintings on the walls could not be removed. Many centuries ago, the unknown hand of a great artist had spent a lifetime of dreary days immortalizing his soul on the chapel's walls. None could tell what dark secret, 
but sorrow had thrown him out of the world into its last forgotten outpost. But all the power and passion, all the fire and rebellious agony of his tortured spirit had been poured into the somber colors on the walls, into majestic figures of a magnificent life, the life his eyes had seen and renounced. And the bodies of tortured saints silently cried of his ecstasy, his doubt, his hunger. Through three narrow slits of windows, a cold haze of light streamed into the library, like a gray fog rolling in from the sea. It left the shadows of centuries to doze in the dark, vaulted corners. It threw white blotches on the rough, unpainted boards of bookshelves that cut into the angel's snowy wings, into the foreheads of saintly patriarchs, on the procession following the cross bearing Jesus to the Golgotha, and above it, on the red letters of a strip, on a strip of white cotton, proletarians of the world unite. Tall candles and silver stands at the altar had to be lighted in the daytime. Their little red flames stood immobile, each candle transformed into a chandelier by the myriads of tiny reflections in the gilded halos of carved saints. They burned without motion, without noise, a silent, resigned service in memory of the past, around a picture of Lenin. Above, on the vaulted ceiling, the unknown artist had placed his last work. A figure of Jesus floated in the clouds, his robe whiter than snow. He looked down with a sad, wise smile, his arms outstretched in silent invitation and blessing. The library was the creation of comrade Fedosich, who liked to claim of our duty to the new culture. The murals did not harmonize with this new culture and comrade Fedosich had tried to improve them. He had painted a red flag into the raised hand of St. Vladimir as that first Christian ruler converted his people to the new faith. He had painted a sickle and hammer on Moses' tablets. But the ancient glazing that protected the murals, its secret lost with the monks, did not take fresh paint well. The red flag ran down the wall and peeled off in pieces. So comrade Fedosich had given up the idea of artistic alterations. He had compromised by tacking over St. Vladimir's stomach a bright red poster bearing a soldier and an airplane and the inscription, comrades, donate to the Red Air Fleet. Okay, next, Fountainhead, part four, chapter 10, another lonely city walk. It had stopped raining, but Peter Keating wished it would start again. The pavements glistened. There were dark blotches on the walls of buildings. And since it did not come from the sky, it looked as if the city were bathed in cold sweat. The air was heavy with untimely darkness, disquieting like premature old age. And there were yellow puddles of light in windows. Keating had missed the rain, but he felt wet from his bones out. Now he walked slowly through the streets full of rain that would not come. He looked up and saw empty space where the towers of familiar buildings had been. It did not look like fog or clouds, but like a solid spread of gray sky that had worked a gigantic, soundless destruction. That sight of buildings vanishing from the sky had always made him uneasy. He walked on, looking down. Rand evidently liked that image of... Uh, buildings vanishing in the fog because an atlas shrugged she uses it from the other direction instead of looking up from the streets uh at it she has uh as peter keating's doing in the fountainhead she's got dagny looking down at it from her penthouse atlas shrugged part two chapter nine clouds had wrapped the sky and had descended as fog to wrap the streets below as if the sky were engulfing the city she could see the whole of Manhattan Island, a long triangular shape cutting into an invisible ocean. It looked like the prow of a sinking ship. A few tall buildings still rose above it like funnels, but the rest was disappearing under gray-blue coils, going down slowly into vapor and space. This was how they had gone, she thought. Atlantis, the city that sank into the ocean, and all the other kingdoms that vanished, leaving the same legend in all the languages of men and the same longing. 
a longing for coffee. Rand incidentally has a nice analysis of that passage in chapter nine of, of her book, The Art of Fiction, uh, which, uh, which is, as I said, about her, her works in the literature, you know, mixture of, of insight and refusal of insight. Uh, but uh, I, I like what she says about the reason she chose the, the wording that she chose in that passage. Uh, all right, so this next passage is from the Fountainhead, part four, chapter 18. This is at the Cortland trial. Um, not only is it a nice passage in itself, but also I think it's a useful corrective to sort of stereotype views about what Rand means by egoism. Uh, people often think she means something very obvious and straightforward and unpleasant by egoism. And uh, the idea here that of independence being uh, a stepping stone to benevolence is, uh, is interesting. A tree branch hung in the open window. The leaves moved against the sky, implying sun and summer and an inexhaustible earth to be used. The leaves drooped, touching the spires of New York's, New York's skyline far across the river. The skyscrapers stood like shafts of sunlight, washed white by distance in summer. A crowd filled the county courtroom, witnessing the trial of Howard Rourke. On the chairs, on the windowsills, in the aisles, pressed against the walls, the human mass was blended like a monolith, except for the pale ovals of faces. The faces stood out, separate, lonely, no two alike. Behind each, there were the years of a life lived or half over, effort, hope in an attempt, honest or dishonest, but an attempt. It left on all a single mark in common, on lips smiling with malice, on lips loose with renunciation, on lips tight with uncertain dignity, on all the mark of suffering. The people had come to witness a sensational case, to see celebrities, to get material for conversation, to be seen, to kill time. They would return to unwanted jobs, unloved families, unchosen friends, to drawing rooms, evening clothes, cocktail glasses and movies, to unadmitted pain, murdered hope, desire left unreached, left hanging silently over a path in which no step was taken, the days of effort not to think, not to say, to forget and give in and give up. But each of them had known some unforgotten moment, a morning when nothing had happened, a piece of music heard suddenly and never heard in the same way again, a stranger's face seen in a bus, a moment when each had known a different sense of living. And each remembered other moments on a sleepless night, on an afternoon of steady rain, in a church, in an empty street at sunset, when each had wondered why there was so much suffering and ugliness in the world. They had not tried to find the answer, and they had gone on living as if no answer were necessary. But each had known a moment when, in lonely, naked honesty, he had felt the need of an answer. Rourke took the oath. He stood by the steps of the witness stand, the audience looked at him. They felt he had no chance. They could drop the nameless resentment, the sense of insecurity which he aroused in most people. And so for the first time, they could see him as he was, a man totally innocent of fear. The fear of which they thought was not the normal kind, not a response to a tangible danger, but the chronic unconfessed fear in which they all lived. They remembered the misery of the moments when in loneliness, a man thinks of the bright words he could have said, but had not found, and hates those who robbed him of his courage. The misery of knowing how strong and able one is in one's own mind, the radiant picture never to be made real. Dreams, self-delusion, or a murdered reality, unborn, killed by that corroding emotion without name, fear, need, dependence, 
hatred. Rourke stood before them as each man stands in the innocence of his own mind. But Rourke stood like that before a hostile crowd, and they knew suddenly that no hatred was possible to him. For the flash of an instant, they grasped the manner of his consciousness. Each asked himself, do I need anyone's approval? Does it matter? Am I tied? And for that instant, each man was free, free enough to feel benevolence for every other man in the room. It was only a moment, the moment of silence when Rourke was about to speak. I actually think that passage is better than, than the speech that Rourke was on to give, but I'm not a good Randian. Okay, this next one is from Atlas Shrugged, part one, chapter five. Francisco Domingo Carlos Andre Sebastián Danconia sat on the floor playing marbles. The marbles spread on the carpet around him were made of the semi-precious stones of his native country, carnelian and rock crystal. She was looking at his face. It was the face she had known. It bore no mark of the kind of life he had led, nor of what she had seen in their last night together. There was no sign of tragedy, no bitterness, no tension, only the radiant mockery, matured and stressed, the look of dangerously unpredictable amusement and the great guiltless serenity of spirit. But this, she thought, was impossible. This was more shocking than all the rest. She said, I came here to ask you a question. Go ahead. When you told those reporters that you came to New York to witness the farce, which farce did you have in mind? He laughed aloud like a man who seldom finds a chance to enjoy the unexpected. That's what I like about you, Dagny. There are seven million people in the city of New York at present. Out of seven million people, you are the only one to whom it could have occurred that I wasn't talking about the veiled divorce scandal. What were you talking about? What alternative occurred to you? The San Sebastian disaster. That's much more amusing than the veiled divorce scandal, isn't it? She said in the solemn, merciless tone of a prosecutor, you did it consciously, cold-bloodedly, and with full intention. You had exhausted every other form of depravity and sought a new thrill by swindling people like Jim and his friends in order to watch them squirm. I don't know what sort of corruption could make anyone enjoy that, but that's what you came to New York to see at the right time. They certainly provided a spectacle of squirming on the grand scale, your brother James in particular. They are rotten fools, but in this case, their only crime was that they trusted you. They trusted your name and your honor. Again, she saw the look of earnestness and again knew with certainty that it was genuine when he said, yes, they did, I know it. And do you find it amusing? No, I don't find it amusing at all. He had continued playing with his marbles, absently, indifferently, taking a shot once in a while. She noticed suddenly the faultless accuracy of his aim, the skill of his hands. He merely flicked his wrist and sent a drop of stone, shooting across the carpet to click sharply against another drop. She thought of his childhood and of the predictions that anything he did would be done superlatively. No, he said, I don't find it amusing. Your brother James and his friends knew nothing about the copper industry. They knew nothing about making money. They did not think it necessary to learn. They considered knowledge superfluous and judgment inessential. They observed that there I was in the world and that I made it my honor to know. They thought they could trust my honor. One does not betray a trust of this kind, does one? Then you did betray it intentionally? That's for you to decide. It was you who spoke about their trust and my honor. I don't think in such terms any longer, he shrugged, adding, I don't give a damn about your brother James and his friends. Their theory was not new, it's worked for centuries, but it wasn't foolproof. There was just one point that they overlooked. They thought it was safe to ride on my brain because they assumed that the goal of my journey was wealth. All their calculations rested on the premise that I wanted to make money. What if I didn't? If you didn't, what did you want? They never asked me that. 
not to inquire about my aims, motives, or desires is an essential part of their theory. If you didn't want to make money, what possible motive could you have had? Any number of them, for instance, to spend it. To spend money on a certain total failure? How was I to know if those minds were a certain total failure? How could you help knowing it? Hmm, quite simply, by giving it no thought. You started that project without giving it any thought? No, not exactly, but suppose I slipped up. I'm only human. I made a mistake. I failed. I made a bad job of it. He flicked his wrist. A crystal marble shot sparkling across the floor and cracked violently against a brown one at the other end of the room. Okay, here's one from We the Living, Part 1, Chapter 12. Historians will write of the Internacional as the great anthem of the revolution. But the cities of the revolution have their own hymn. In days to come, the men of Petrograd will remember those years of hunger and struggle and hope to the convulsive rhythm of John Gray. It was called a foxtrot. It had a tune and a rhythm such as those of the new dances far across the border, abroad. Men stood in line at the cooperatives and whistled John Gray. Workers' clubs listened attentively to a lecture on Marxism, then relaxed while a comrade showed his skill on a piano out of tune playing John Gray. Its gaiety was sad. Its abrupt rhythm was hysterical. Its frivolity was a plea, a moan, for that which existed somewhere, forever out of need reach. Through winter nights, red flags whistled in the snowdrifts, and the city prayed hopelessly with the short, sharp notes of John Gray. And here I'll let you hear it, so you can judge uh, whether she's accurately described the convulsive rhythm and the, the sad gaiety uh, of this piece. And I'll put a link to in the description so that you can uh, listen to the rest of it. Uh, it's a uh, piece I would never have discovered were not for uh, Rand, and I'm quite fond of it. And simply the um, uh, the um, uh, the anthology essays on. We the Living misidentifies uh, which piece of music it is that Rand had in mind. There's another piece called John Gray, which I think was was sort of inspired by our riff on this one, and they think it's that one, but it, it's this one um, uh, by Matve Blanter as the uh, is the one whose song that is. Um, descriptions of music are actually kind of a recurring element throughout Rand's fiction, both both descriptions of actual music, uh, in most cases, um, everything from uh, um, Kalman's uh, Bayadera to uh, Rachmaninoff to um, uh, a swing adaptation, which was a real thing, of uh, um, Wagner's Evening Star, um, also fictional imaginary music like the uh, Song of Broken Glass and With the Living and um, uh, to various pieces by Richard Halley, Halley and um, Atlas Shrugged. 
Uh, anyway, here's just one more very short uh, description of a piece of music. Uh, this is from We the Living, Part 1, Chapter 7. Lydia played Chopin, the wistful music, delicate as rose petals, falling slowly in the darkness of an old park, rang softly through the haze of soap fumes. And Rand doesn't say whether she has a particular Chopin piece in mind. It seems like the, the description could probably fit a number of them, but I think that it fits Nocturne Opus 10, number two, as well as it fits any. Uh, and so let me just hear a, a smidgen of that. I think that you know, rose petals falling slowly and uh, wistfully in the darkness, that's not a bad uh, image to go with that music. Um, I'll put a link also in the, in the description to that piece of music uh, too, which I did not discover through Rand, but... Uh, okay, so final, final passage, this will be the longest one but the final one um i've abridged it i've abridged, a number of these ones that i've read i've abridged i haven't read the whole thing i've i've left out parts because you know yeah probably the main reason is that you know there's you know my my internet hookup is uh is slow uh and um uh you know i don't want too massive of video to upload and also of course you know uh you know don't want the ip hawks over my shoulders and again there's you know there's no uh particular reason for me to you know for me to include more than i need to make my point uh so anyway the, this is a slightly abridged but um nevertheless the longest one this is the the bravura passage at the beginning of uh part two of we the living It was St. Petersburg. The war made it Petrograd. The revolution made it Leningrad. It is a city of stone, and those living in it think not of stone brought upon a green earth and piled block on block to raise a city, but of one huge rock carved into streets, bridges, houses, and earth brought in handfuls, scattered, ground into the stone to remind them of that which lies beyond the city. Its trees are rare strangers, Sickly foreigners in a climate of granite, forlorn and superfluous. Its parks are reluctant concessions. In spring, a rare dandelion sticks a bright yellow head through the stones of its embankments. And men smile at it incredulously and condescendingly as at an impudent child. Its spring does not rise from the soil. Its first violets and very red tulips and very blue hyacinths come in the hands of men on street corners. Petrograd was not born, it was created. The will of a man raised it where men did not choose to settle. An implacable emperor commanded into being the city and the ground under the city. Men brought earth to fill a swamp where no living thing existed but mosquitoes. And like mosquitoes, men died and fell into the grunting mire. No willing hands came to build the new capital. It rose by the labor of soldiers, thousands of soldiers, regiments who took orders and could not refuse to face a deadly foe, a gun or a swamp. They fell, and the earth they brought and their bones made the ground for the city. Petrograd, its residents say, stands on skeletons. Petrograd is not in a hurry and is not lazy. It is gracious and leisurely as befits the freedom of its vast streets. It is a city that threw itself down amid the marshes and pine forests, luxuriously, both arms outflung. Its squares are paved fields. 
Its streets are as broad as tributaries to the Neva, the widest river to cross a great city. On Nevsky, the capital of the capital streets, the houses were built by generations past for generations to come. They are set and unchangeable like fortresses. Their walls are thick and their windows are tiers of deep niches rising over wide sidewalks of reddish brown granite. From the statue of Alexander III, a huge gray man on a huge gray horse, silver rails stretch tense and straight to the Admiralty building far away, its white colonnade and thin golden spire raised like the crown, the symbol, the trademark of Nevsky. Over the broken skyline where every turret and balcony and gargoyle bending over the street are ageless features of a frozen stone face. On winter nights, strings of large white globes flare up over Nevsky, and snow sparkles over the white lights like salt crystals. And the colored lanterns of tramways, red, green, yellow, wink far away, swimming over a soft darkness. And through lashes moist with frost, the white globes look like crosses of long white searchlights on a black sky. Nevsky starts on the shore of the Nieva at a key as trim and perfect as a drawing room with a red granite parapet and a row of palaces of straight angles, tall windows, chaste columns and balustrades, severe, harmonious, and luxuriously stern in their masculine grace. Divided by the river, Petrograd's greatest mansion, the, with the Winter Palace, faces Petrograd's greatest prison, the Peter Paul Fortress. The Tsars lived in the Winter Palace. When they died, they crossed the Neva. In the cathedral of the fortress, white slabs rose over the graves of the Tsars. The prison stood behind the cathedral. The walls of the fortress guarded the dead Tsars and the Tsars' living enemies. In the long, silent halls of the palace, Tall mirrors reflected the ramparts behind which men were forgotten, alive for decades in lonely stone graves. Bridges rise over the river as long humps of steel with tramways crawling slowly up to the middle and rolling swiftly clattering down to the other shore. The right bank beyond the fortress is a gradual surrender of the city to that earth, that countryside it has driven out. The Kamyonostrovsky, a broad, quiet, endless avenue is like a stream full of the fragrance of a future sea, a street where each step is a forecast of the country to come. The avenue and the city and the river end at the islands where the Nieva breaks among bits of land held together by delicate bridges where heavy white cones rise in tears edged with dark green over a deep silence of snow and fir branches and bird footprints alone break the white desolation and beyond the last island, the sky and sea are an unfinished watercolor of pale gray with a faint greenish band smeared across to mark a future horizon. But Petrograd also has side streets. Petrograd's side streets are of colorless stone rainwashed into the gray of the clouds above and of the mud below. They are bare as jail corridors. They cut each other in naked corners of square buildings that look like prisons. Old gateways are locked at night over mud swollen ruts. Little shops frown with faded signs over turbid windows. Little parks choke with consumptive grass into which mud and dust and mud again have been ground from a century. Iron parapets guard canals of refuse thickened water. On dark corners, rusty icons of the Madonna are nailed over forgotten tin boxes, begging coppers for orphanages. And farther up the Nieva rise forests of red brick chimneys, spewing a black cloud that hangs over old, stooping wooden houses, over an embankment of rotting logs at the placid, indifferent river. Rain falls slowly through the smoke. Rain, smoke, and stone are the theme song of the city. Pietrograd's residents wonder sometimes at the strange bonds that hold them. After the long winter, they curse the mud and the stone and cry for pine forests. They flee from the city as if from a hated stepmother. They flee to green grass and sand and to the sparkling capitals of Europe. And as to an unconquerable mistress, they return in the fall, hungry for the wide streets, the shrieking tramways and the cobblestones, serene and relieved as if life were beginning again. Pietrograd, they say, is the only city.
Cities grow like forests, like weeds. Petrograd did not grow. It was born, finished, and complete. Petrograd is not acquainted with nature. It was the work of man. Nature makes mistakes and takes chances. It mixes its colors and knows little straight lines. But Petrograd is the work of man who knows what he wants. Petrograd's grandeur is unmarred, its squalor unrelieved. Its facets are cut clearly, sharply. They are deliberate, perfect with a straightforward perfection of man's work. Cities grow with a people and fight for the place at the head of cities and rise slowly up the steps of years. Petrograd did not rise. It came to be at the height. It was commanded to command. It was a capital before its first stone was laid. It was a monument to the spirit of man. Peoples know nothing of the spirit of man, for peoples are only nature, and man is a word that has no plural. Petrograd is not of the people. It has no legend, no folklore. It is not glorified in nameless songs down nameless roads. It is a stranger, aloof, incomprehensible, forbidding. No pilgrims ever traveled to its granite gates. The gates had never been opened in warm compassion to the meek, the hurt, and the maimed like the doors of the kindly Moscow. Petrograd does not need a soul. It has a mind. And perhaps it is only a coincidence that in the language of the Russians, Moscow is she, or Petrograd has ever been he. And perhaps it is only a coincidence that those who seized on the power in the name of the people transferred their capital to the meek Moscow from the haughty aristocrat of cities. In 1924, a man named Lenin died, and the city was ordered to be called Leningrad. The revolution also brought posters to the city walls and red banners to its houses and sunflower seed shells to its cobblestones. It cut a proletarian poem into the pedestal of the statue of Alexander III and put a red rag on a stick in the hand of Catherine II in a small garden off Nevsky. It called Nevsky Prospect of October 25th, and Sadovaya, a cross street, Street of July 3rd, in honor of dates it wanted remembered. And at the intersection, hefty conductresses yell on the crowded tramways, corner of October 25th and July 3rd, terminal for yellow tickets, new fare citizens. In the early summer of 1925, the State Textile Trust put out new cotton prints, and women smiled in the streets of Petrograd, women wearing dresses made of new materials for the first time in many years. But there were only half a dozen patterns of prints in the city. Women in black and white checks passed women in black and white checks. Women in red dotted white met women in green dotted white. Women with spirals of blue on a gray dress met women with the same spirals of brown on a tan dress. They passed by like inmates of a huge orphanage, frowning, sullen, uncomfortable, losing all joy in their new garments. On street corners, in the sun, ragged men sold saccharin and plaster busts of linen. Sparrows chirped on telephone wires. Lines stood at the doors of cooperatives. Women took off their jackets and in short-sleeved, wrinkled blouses offered flabby white arms to the first heat of the summer sun. A poster hung high on a wall. On the poster, a huge worker swung a hammer toward the sky, and the shadow of the hammer fell like a huge black cross over the little buildings of the city under his boots. Okay, that was the last passage. I haven't m offered much in the way of argument that these passages represent good writing. I'm willing to have that conversation. There's stuff to be said, I think, but for the purposes of this video, I'm just really imitating what Rourke did not at the Cortland trial where he talked on and on, but at the Stoddard trial where he just submitted photos of his own work as his sole defense. In the novel, he's doing this compared to the story of, of uh, Phryne or Thrune, the Greek courtesan who supposedly disrobed or was disrobed by her advocate in front of an Athenian jury on the idea that her pulchritude would stun them into acquitting her. Uh, I forget of what offense. Probably impiety. When in doubt, it's usually impiety. Um, uh, anyway, although the tactic allegedly worked for a Friday, it doesn't work for Rourke. And I likewise don't know whether these passages from Rand will convince you that whatever else she is, she's a good writer. But for the present, 
the defense rests. So uh, uh, if you want to see uh, more coffee and philosophy from me, uh, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. And see you next time.